I'm going to record it from here. Y buenos días, buenos días. Espero que ustedes estén bien. I hope you guys are well. Um, we are going to spend most of today talking about um, three things, two, two three things. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some more. We're going to show more examples of the differences between ser and estar and those few little odd things with tener. We're going to talk about descriptions. So that means adjective words. And that's kind of a big deal in Spanish because they have to go into gender and number. Um, I'll take any questions you're going to have on that as we uh, go through the paces. We're, we're going to interject this vocabulary of la casa into that. Uh, so we'll be kind of combining three different things. Um, Okay, I'm going to add one little extra thing. And this is like super small extra. I'm going to make sure that we do more on this in fall if you're going to continue just because my other students always need a review on it. Um, I'm not going to do any more on numeros for now because we need to get into other, you know, ideas and expressions. But I do want to tell you that when you are using uh, numeros, when you are using numbers for años, years, when you are talking about years, like say you need to say when, what year somebody was born, okay, or talk about any year whatsoever, uh, we cannot. I just want you to know this and we'll see a few examples, but we won't practice it a lot. Um, if somebody wants to say, I was born in 1962 or 1963, let's call it, digamos, digamos 1963. In Spanish, when we express a year, we cannot say it as 19 and 63 or 18 and 35. We have to say it as the full thousands and hundreds numbers which sounds kind of cumbersome probably to us in English, but that is the way they do it. So I can't say 1963. I'm going to need to say it as 1,963. That's the way the year has to be expressed. So, but again, for example, and we'll get to more into this in the fall, but just to give you a few examples, this would be mil for the thousand, right? 1963. Mil. 963. Okay, so that year would have to be set as 1963. That's just the way they express years. Let's say you want to talk about something historical. 1492, it becomes 1490. Idos. Okay. Bien. Uh, if somebody asks for your kid's birthday, and let's say they were born in this year, 1995, it becomes mil novecientos noventa y cinco. Okay. Uh, the 2000 years are great. 2005. Dos mil cinco. Boom, that's it, okay? So the 2,000 years are easy because they're short. <laughs> 2005, 2020, you know, uh, the 2,000 years are easy. But other ones we have to express as, as well, well, all of them are expressing in the thousands, thousands and hundreds. So para que sepan, just so you know that it's done that way. And we'll do more with that in the fall session because uh, we're gonna do a little review on numbers come fall when we start that. Okay, a ver. Uh, bueno, adelante, forward. We are going to start off with some work on ser and estar and tener. Tener when it does mean have, tener when it means, um, when, it, when it is used with, expressions, we call them modismos. They are, they are not easily translatable expressions, but just the way they say certain uh, uh, 
ideas. Uh, formally, they call them tener idioms, which means a strictly non-translatable sentence. Okay. Uh, I want to ask first, uh, I want to ask first, I had sent off as a homework, and hopefully you watched this. Uh, uh, hopefully you watched this little thing about to be and not to be. <laughs> yeah. Ser versus estar versus, oh, some, but not a lot, some ways when we use tener to say I am, you are, he is, they are, okay. Uh, did you have any questions about something you saw in that video where you say, ooh, I didn't know what she was getting at with that. I don't know what she meant. She gave a lot of examples. And by the way, there was only one example of this that I really, really object to. I'm gonna find where it is. Uh, ooh, perdón. I need to... Uh, and I wanna caution against this. Oh, where is it? Oh, Aki, here. This one I want to caution you guys on if you ever travel. Or actually even just talk with anybody. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, <clears throat> big X. Never, never, never say what you see on that screen. Soy Americana or soy americano, at all costs, do not use that phrase. The soy part is great. The americano thing, really, 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 uh, truly offensive to most people in Latin America. Offensive to really, I dare say, all people who are Latin American. They find that very offensive and very egocentric and very rude. They really don't like to hear that expression. I'm surprised they put that in the video. Um, do not ever use the expression soy americano or soy americana because that is uh, the sure way to tick somebody off. Uh, the way we uh, yeah, tell somebody where we're from is not using the word americano because they consider as Latin Americans that uh, they, they consider that we are all Americans because we're all in the Americas. So remember, never, never soy americano or soy americano, but soy estadounidense. Uh, or as an alternative, soy norte americano. And of course, it might be norte americana. Those, those terms uh, for US citizen are considered okay and super, super. Uh, acceptable to Latin Americans, right? Norte Americano or the feminine version Norte Americano is okay. This one I know is a mouthful for most people to say Estado Unidense, break it into two parts. Estado and Unidense, those are okay. And we always use soy to express uh, um, nationality, but don't uh, you know, but don't use Americano. They really, really, truly find that offensive. Also, probably a good idea not to say things like this. Um, uh, if you're abroad, if you're here in the States, it's perfectly cool. But if you're abroad, soy de Arizona. People in other countries generally don't like when we say like we're from a state like people from other countries don't necessarily know all 50 states. They probably don't know, know New York, California, Florida, and you know, a few others, but they kind of don't like that because they would rather know what country you're from. So, soy de uh, Estados Unidos is great, but in general, don't say your state because they may not always know where that state is. And then it makes them a little uncomfortable. Um, you know, just from not in an offensive way, but like, okay, where's that? Uh, so give your nationality if you're traveling abroad. Okay. Um, vale. Bueno. 
Okay, um, we're going to pass by that video and we're going to pass into why we use ser versus estar. And uh, again, uh, we're going to do a lot of examples with this today so that you get it. Oh, and I need to make this bigger. Ah, lost the whole thing. For some reason, my things are not fitting on my screen. Okay. A ver, uh, we use ser to say I am, you are, he is, they are for things that are considered kind of more permanent or hard to change, right? Uh, we use it for descriptions that are physical traits. You know, that's the way the person looks uh, for personality traits as well. Just the way that person generally acts to talk about occupation, what you do for a living, we use ser to talk about, uh, well, we did the characteristics thing, personality traits. We use it for telling time. We'll probably, um, I, I can, I'll probably get into a little intro with that uh, the last session, but not today yet. Um, origin, where you're from, uh, and relationships, because ser is used to identify. It's used to identify who or what somebody is, okay? And then of course for estar, for how you feel or where you are, always use the verb estar for, so for health, how you feel, or emotions, how you feel, estar. For uh, location, for location, location, and it doesn't matter if that location is permanent or temporary. Anytime you talk about location, we use estar because estar indicates a state, a condition that may change. Okay. Um, and um, therefore, that is appropriate. So let's take a look at some examples. Vamos a practicar, and we'll get to tener in just a bit. We're going to do some examples. Vamos a describir. We're going to describe some people. We're going to use ser and maybe estar to talk about this person. Hmm, quién es? Quién es? I'm going to ask, who is she? Quién es? And I'm going to introduce a, a new ish uh, question word. Quién means who? Quién es? And I don't even have to say ella because you see her, I assume you know she's a female. Quien es? Who is she? Ella es? Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Ella es Meryl Streep. Well, let's talk about Meryl Streep. What could we say about Meryl Streep using either ser or estar? Es you might be... actress. Oh, okay, es actriz. Es actriz. Uh, you might say, well, wait a minute, profession, can't you change your profession? But profession falls into the ser category, okay? How you feel and where you are, always use the verb estar. What you do for a living doesn't fall into how you feel or where you are. Oh, it's got to be ser. See what I'm doing here? How you feel and where you are, always use the verb estar. If it doesn't fit that rhyme, it's the other verb, it's ser. So, Es actriz. And notice we don't say es una actriz. We don't say she's an actress. In English, we say she's an actress. We skip the word an when we talk about professions with ser. Es actriz. Okay. Es actriz. Es. Oh, could I even add a description? Es buena actriz. Es buena actriz. Es buena actriz. See? ¿Sí? Bien? Okay. What else might we say about her using ser or estar? She's es long. contenta. Oh. Ah, perdón, otra vez again? Es contenta. Uh, contenta, happy. Is that how you feel or where you are? No. Sorry. Happy? <laughs> Now, okay, you could say es contenta, but then, uh, or es feliz. Es, es, uh, de norte americana. 
Uh, okay, Let, let's go with both of those. Es contenta or es feliz would mean she is a happy person, meaning kind of like all the time. But, and, and then we're gonna go with your uh, nationality thing for a, a minute here. Uh, so, es contenta, es feliz, she's a happy person, that works, that works. But if I am going just on, oh, she's smiling, therefore she feels happy, then I can't say es feliz, okay? Most of the time when we're talking about people and they say she's happy, I mean, think about it. It really depends on what you mean. If you mean to say, if you're describing kids in your family and you say, oh, this little kid, my kid, my son, my daughter, is a happy little kid, and you mean they're always happy-go-lucky, then es, es feliz or, or, or es contento is perfectly okay. But most of the time when we talk about somebody is happy, most of the time we're talking about how they feel in that moment, yeah? Oh, they're smiling, therefore I assume they must be feeling this way. So most of the time, this will be expressed with esta contenta, not not es contenta. They, es contenta or es feliz uh, uh, projects a different image than está contenta, está feliz. That means está contenta, está feliz in the moment. Oh, she's smiling, therefore she must feel this way. Okay, so cuidado, careful, okay? Um, most of the time we wind up using estar with that, but if you are really talking about their personal characteristic overall, then said is okay. Now we're gonna talk about where she's from. Uh, where she's from is uh, Estados Unidos or North America, right? Um, origin is ser, so es de Estados Unidos. Es de, she's from. Es de Estados Unidos. She's from the United States. Or I might say she is, and then give the nationality. I, es de, and country, right? Es de Estados Unidos. But if we take out that word de, and we plug in instead of the country and nationality, it's es Estado Unidense. Es estadounidense, or I could say es norteamericana. Bien, okay. What else might I say about her? Uh, es un rubio. Es, ah, es, she's blonde. And we won't say she's a blonde. We're gonna say she's blonde, okay? okay. And now she's a, she's a woman. So I have to express it not as es rubio, but rubia. Rubia. Es rubia. Okay. Es rubia. I can't say es rubio. I mean, you could, but then they would look at you funny if you're talking about a woman. <laughs> and if it's the woman yourself you're talking to, she might feel like, kind of like, really? Do I look like a guy? Okay. Es rubia. Es rubia. I could maybe say es alta. What if I want to say she's working in Los Angeles right now? She's in LA. Would it be es en Los Angeles or está en Los Angeles? Where she's working. Where she is. I'd be S. For how you feel and where you are, always use the verb. Oh, a star. Ah, okay, so let's try that again. Está en Los Angeles, right? Está en Los Angeles. So here's the clue. If, if ever you're using en, you're telling in, and that's a location, right? You need to use estar. Está en Los Angeles. Está en California. Uh, está 
eh, está en el estudio. She's in the studio, in the studio, because she's filming something, right? Sí, bien. Ok. Do those examples of said and estar make sense to you, or is there something in there that is puzzling? If not, we're going to move on to some more examples. No? Bien? Bien. Ok. Otra cosa. Otra cosa. Ah, bueno. Vamos a ver. Uh, let's talk about this guy. Ooh. Need to first of all make him a little bit smaller. Ooh, and it won't let me. Okay. That's fine. That's because I made the screen big. Vamos a ver. Let's talk about this guy. Quién es? Quién es? Who is he? Quién es? Quién? Quién means who? Quién es? I'm IDing him. I'm IDing who he is. Identifying. And is Leo DiCaprio. Es Leo DiCaprio. Es. I have. I yeah. Es. Leo DiCaprio. Ooh, I am a little bit challenged with spelling DiCaprio. I hope I spelled that right. Es Leo DiCaprio. What, what might we say about him? Es guapo. Es guapo. He's good looking. Es guapo. He's good looking. Muy bien. What he generally looks like. Vale, magnífico. ¿Qué más? What else can we say about him? What he looks like, what he does for a living, where he's from, where he's located right now, anything. Es. I'm going to give a, a, this. Es, es. Famoso. Es famoso. Oh, let's give him two characteristics. Es famoso y, ri y uh, rico. Es famoso y rico. Bien. Es famoso, es rico. Uh, um, es actor. What he does for a living, right? Uh, está... And, ooh, donde esta, donde esta, where is he? I'm going to say he's filming somewhere. I'm going to make this up. Está en Canadá, por ejemplo. I don't know if he really is, but if I'm talking about where he's located, because I've got en, in, a place, that's location for how you feel and where you are, always use the verb estar. Está en Canadá, está en Canadá. Okay, vale. Uh, bueno. Bien. Let's flip, flip to somebody else. Let's flip to a plural group. Instead of es, we're going to need son for some of these. Uh, we're going to need son. And oh, and if I want to say who, but I'm talking about a group of people, it's not quien es, but it's quien es, who plural. Think Dr. Seuss, the who's of whoville, yeah. Uh, quien es son, quien es son, quien es son. Who are these people? We could say, we can even talk about their gender. Son, son chicas, they're girls. Okay, that's really super, gen super general, right? Son chicas, son atletas, they are 
athletes, ¿sí? Son atletas. Uh, son, I'm going to say they're, oh, they're athletes. Son, I'm going to say they're athletic. Not they're athletes, but they're athletic. Part of their, uh, part of their physical characteristics in general is that they are uh, endowed with special athletic characteristics, right? Son atléticas. They're athletic. Ah, son fuertes, son fuertes, son fuertes, son fuertes. They are strong, strong, son fuertes. Sí, ah, son de Estados Unidos. Bien. Ah, están contentas. We could say they look pretty happy in that picture. What about if they feel nervous because they're competing? Would that be ser or estar? They feel nervous, nerviosas. Estar. Estar, because it's how they feel. It's a temporary state. So, están nerviosas. Están nerviosas. Ah, where are they located right now? They are not in the United States. Están en Tokio. En Tokio. Japón. Japón. Se dice Japón en español. Japón. Están en Tokio, Japón. Están en los Juegos Olímpicos. Están en los Juegos Olímpicos. ¿Bien? ¿Bien? Ok. Vale. Magnífico. Do those examples make sense to you? Sí o no? Sí. Sí? Bien. And the more examples you see in here, the more that will sound kind of natural. Uh, we will do one more example. Un ejemplo más. Ah, quién es? Quién es? And I need to make this a smaller size for a moment because I really need to put in my, my text box. And this is kind of a famous picture of a famous person. Oops. And most people have seen this picture of this gentleman. Uh, este hombre, eh, bueno. Es hombre, es obvio que es hombre. It is obvious that this is a man. Okay. Uh, es un hombre. He's a man. Es atleta. He's an athlete. Sí. Uh, ¿Quién es? Es. Es el señor Bolt. <laughs> He's Mr. Mm -hmm. Bolt, right? Uh, you saying? You saying Bolt? You saying? Es, oh, perdón. Es Usain Bolt. Mm. Es muy rápido. He is really fast. rápido. Fast. Es muy rápido. Es muy rápido. Es de Jamaica. He's from Jamaica. Sí. Es de Jamaica. Está. Ooh, but if I want to say he is in Jamaica, because he's not in Tokyo, he's not competing, uh, I would have to say está en Jamaica. Está en Jamaica. Bien. Okay. Uh, okay. Está, I want to say he's excited because he just won, right, in this picture. Está 
emocionado. Está emocionado. He's very excited. I want you to caution you about this word excited. The word excited can be emocionado. It can be also, that's a harder word to pronounce, entusiasmado, enthused. We don't say enthused very often in English, do we? Entusiasmado, emocionado, emocionado does not mean, mean emotional. It means excited. Do not, do not, do not use the word excitado. No, 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 no. Excitado means horny. <laughs> so don't use that. Because you may say, oh, excitado, yeah, it, it, it means like excited. No, it does not. It means something else. And they're going to think, well, that's sort of a personal observation, dude. Yeah, so don't use that word. Emocionado for excited. Excitado, no, no, no. Because you're going to get like, yeah, people like hey, you like that. Like, well, okay, we're going down that path. No, okay, está bien. Uh, bueno, okay. Vale, magnifico. Um, ser en estar is a deep, deep topic. It needs lots of review, lots of times. Again, it is something we will review more in fall, but I am going to talk about tener for a little bit before we leave that topic entirely because we want to delve into adjectives really soon. Um, ser en estar, by the way, this is how hard it is for English speakers. Ser en estar... Uh, you need to see that many examples and more. Uh, if you go to high school and you take Spanish, you study ser en estar the first year, you study it again second year, and you think, okay, I do it better. I do it better now, second year. You study again third year. The third year people say, I know this stuff because I got A's. I know this stuff. And then they're like, oh, I didn't know as much as I thought. Wow, there's more for me to learn about ser en estar. Fourth year, they study it some more. My daughter went to university, took her minor in Spanish. She studied uh, ser in two more classes beyond. So people study ser estar for years and years over and over and over and find points because for English speakers, it's a very easy thing to get them confused. We don't have an equivalent at all in English. Okay, so just know, uh, if you feel like, well, I kind of get said is that right, like maybe half the time, don't feel bad. We're going to come back and revisit that pretty much all the time. And you'll see little examples even today as we're not using said is that, but as we get into adjectives, you're going to see it over and over again. Okay, we do want to talk a little bit about this verb tener. This verb tener has, has two purposes. It's to use to talk about what you physically have, what you own, what somebody owns, uh, what something has. And then it's also used in what we call idioms. And that's what we're going to talk about more in about three minutes. Okay. So, uh, tener has these forms. And I am going to try to make this one bigger. Uh, Tener has these forms, like ser, like estar, it is a super irregular verb, sadly. It is super, super irregular. Uh, tener, when you look at tener, uh, it's T-E-N-E-R, and you would think that most of the verb would sound like T-E-N, T-E-N, and it does in the yo form, and it does in the nosotros form, but the, uh, and it does in the vosotros form too. Uh, but in most of these forms, in the form to talk uh, to somebody directly as a friend, to the L A A usted form, the ellos se a ustedes form, it's not T E N, it's T I E. And you need to hear all those sounds. So I'm going to say them. Actually, I want everybody to repeat these forms of tener with me, okay? 
so that you get the sound of it right. Because tener, in English, we use have a lot. In almost all languages, we use the verb that means have a lot. And in Spanish, you will use it a lot for different reasons, to talk about what you own or to talk about how you feel in certain uh, situations. So, bueno, repitan por favor, tengo. Tengo. Tengo, I have, tengo. Okay. Tengo. But tú, tienes. Tienes. Yes. Tienes. And you need to make all of those sounds pronounced. Tienes. 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 Perfecto. And the next one, el tiene. 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 Ella tiene. Ella, Ella tiene. tiene. Usted tiene. Usted tiene. Bien. We go back to 10, 10, 10 for nosotros. Tenemos. 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 Tenéis is only used in space. So we're going to kind of gloss over that. The tenéis is the you guys, plural, but for buddies, but they don't use it in Latin America. So the they form, ellos. Ellos tienen. Ellos tienen. Ellos tienen. Ellos tienen. Bueno, ellas, if it's an all gal group. Ellas tienen. Ellas tienen. Bien, bien. And ustedes tienen. Ustedes tienen. 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 Okay. So uh, the verb that means have. Okay. Those are just the forms. So sometimes we use this to say that you actually have something in your possession. Like, tengo un plano. I have a city map. Plano is a city map. You know, like a walking map, they might give you, it has like, you know, a five mile square area, maybe around the, the hotel. Tengo un plano or tengo un mapa. Tienes medicinas aquí. Do you have medicines here? Tiene usted comida vegetariana. Do you have vegetarian food? So whether we're asking do you have in a friendly way, tienes? Or do you have in a formal way, like if you're in a restaurant and you're a vegetarian and you wanna know, do they have vegetarian food, tiene usted? Uh, we use tener, do you have something, okay? Is it in your possession? Tengo, tienes, tiene. Notice when we ask a question that's a yes, no question, like, do you have medicines? Do you have vegetarian food? This whole thing of that word do, we need the word do in English. Do signals a do or does. <laughs> do and does are totally kind of useless words, but we need them with questions in English. We need them to lead off a yes, no question in English. Yeah. We never say, well, how often do you have, have, well, yes, have you got, we might, but have you have you medicines well people don't talk that way do you have medicines right we don't need that word do in spanish we just use the verb a yes no question you just you can lead off with the verb word to ask that question tienes do you have tiene usted do you have okay bien uh but and sometimes we use it uh to talk about uh, about other people, not to talk about you, not to talk about me, but mi esposo tiene dolor de cabeza. Dolor de cabeza is pain in the head. Pain of the head. That's where they say headache. Mi esposo tiene dolor de cabeza. Uh, it might express a negative idea. And if it does that, no will be in front of the verb. Mi amigo no tiene billete. My friend does not have a ticket. No tiene. No tiene, doesn't have. Tiene, tiene, has. No tiene, doesn't have. If you make it negative, you just put a no in front of the verb, okay? Mi amigo no tiene billeta. La señora tiene un problema. La señora Tiene un problema. I'm talking about her, so I use tiene. Tiene un problema. She has a problem. So notice sometimes we say she has a problem. That's an abstract thing. We might say no tiene billete 
doesn't have a ticket and the ticket is not an abstract thing. It's an actual physical thing somebody will or will not have, right? Um, we might use tener to talk about more than one people uh, or more than one people, more than one person, right? Uh, we might say we have, tenemos tarjeta de crédito. Tenemos, we have, tenemos tarjeta uh, de crédito. If I use tenemos, it means I have people with me, right? If I'm just talking about me, it's tengo, I have. But if I am with a family, a, a, a spouse, a partner, a friend, a kid, it's tenemos, we have. Okay, and notice we never use the word we, we hardly, well, we hardly ever use the word we, right? Because it's all built into the verb, tenemos means we have. Uh, you want to ask, hey, do you guys have a menu? Tienen ustedes un menu? Ah, you know, a waiter might ask, he might not know if somebody gave you the menus. Tienen ustedes un menu? Do you have a menu? Right? Uh, mis amigos no tienen Dinero en efectivo, it might be a negative idea. For a negative idea, no comes before the verb. Mis amigos, more than one of them, mis amigos no tienen dinero en efectivo. My friends do not have cash. Dinero en efectivo means money in cash. Sometimes, dinero by itself means money. Sometimes people shorten this phrase just to that, efectivo. Efectivo looks like effective. What it really means is cash instead of a debit card, instead of a credit card, instead of a check, okay? So some people shorten dinero en efectivo to just efectivo, cash. So I'm gonna leave efectivo up because that is a very acceptable, shorter way to say cash. Mis amigos no tienen efectivo. They have no cash. Okay. Marilyn? Yes, sí. Excuse me, I have a couple no. questions. Sí, sí, dime. Two slides back, there was an LA, a la, I believe, I think it was a la senora. Uh, I notice on Duolingo, sometimes we use L or la, and sometimes we don't. Ah, bueno. Buena pregunta, when do you do that? How do you know? Okay, so here is the short answer. If you, if you mess up on that, people will still understand what you're talking about. That's the good news, okay? So if you forget to use an el or a la, but you get the vocabulary word right, that's more important. But when do I use el or when do I use la? <coughs> Uh, especially with, oh, with titles, with titles related to people. And let me show you that because you probably have seen that on Duolingo quite a lot. And sometimes they say el señor and sometimes right. they say la señora and sometimes they just say señor and señora and women. Why? Okay, here's how it runs. Um, use el or la if you are talking about the person, about the person, okay? Un ejemplo, un ejemplo. Uh, el señor, el señor Ducey es gobernador. Mr. Ducey is governor. I'm talking about Mr. Ducey, okay? Oh, por ejemplo, por ejemplo. Uh, let's say you've got, let's say you've got a lady doctor. La doctora, uh, la do doctora Garcia está en, uh, está en el consultorio. Consultorio is a fancy word for office. Professionals like doctors and lawyers have a consultorio, a consulting room, right? That means office, oficina. La doctora Gar Garcia está en el consultorio, right? Uh, 
Dr. Garcia, and I'm talking not to her, but about her, uh, is in the office, okay? But to talk uh, directly, oh, <laughs> directo, directly to someone, skip the L, skip the la, okay? So when you address somebody and you're speaking to them, don't use the L, don't use the la. So it would be, uh, let's say you're a reporter, right? Uh, and you might say, Senor Ducey. Como estas? Como estas hoy? How are you today? Ah, you're talking directly to him. You got the microphone. Ah, Senor Ducey, como estas? See, or you might be to, talking to the lady doctor, right? Uh, doctora, Doctora Garcia. Tengo un problema muy grave. I've got a really serious problem. Tengo un problema muy grande. So if I speak to somebody directly, skip the el or la. If I'm talking about them, they're not there then I use that before a title like doctor, mister, mrs. Uh, some even use uh, 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 what we would call an honorific um, a title with a lawyer's, they'll say el licenciado, licenciado, licensed person. So, you know, uh, whether they're a medical doctor or a PhD doctor doesn't really matter. If they have the title doctor, um, it gets, it gets an error allowed with it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Very bien, de nada. Okay, bien. So when you speak to somebody directly, skip the other the la. You're talking about them, uh, then that's a different thing. Okay, we're going to move on to tener. When tener is not have, when it is not have, sometimes tener falls into that category of set or estar sometimes, but only in specific areas. So that makes it a little bit easier. In Spanish, there are certain, what we call idioms. Ooh, I have to put my share screen on. You can't see this if I don't put it up. Okay. These are called the idioms. Idioms are special language ex uh, expressions. They are common expressions. They are non-translatable because if you translate them word for word, they sound goofy in English, but they're not goofy in Spanish. Okay. Por ejemplo, for example, uh, and usually these deal with some sort of a physical or mental sensation, usually a physical sensation. Uh, you don't say, you don't say in Spanish, that you are hungry. You say you have hunger. That's just the way they do it. French does that. German even does that. Um, you have to express it as have hunger. Tengo hambre. And these are expressions that are very, very common that people use all the time when they talk to people in their group. They talk to somebody they need help from. Um, you know, we use these every day. Tener hambre. So, tengo hambre, I'm hungry. Tienes hambre, are you hungry? Tienes hambre, right? You can't be thirsty, you have thirst. Tengo sed, tener sed, to be thirsty. Sed is thirst. That's just the way they express this idea. Tengo sed. I'm thirsty. Tenemos sed. We're thirsty. So you go into a restaurant. This will be something that a waiter may typically ask you, right, before he leads off or after he even leads off with your order. Uh, oddly enough, in Spanish, this is a biggie because people who are learning to speak English from Spanish don't say I am 60 years old. They say I have 60 years. This is a mistake that Spanish speakers learning English make quite a lot because this is the way they say. You never say I am, you cannot say soy. Uh, if you wanna say I'm 40, you can't say soy 40. You can't say that. It has to be I have 
the number and the word years. Tengo 40 años. Tengo uh, 60, 60 años. Uh, if I talk about my kid, mi hijo tiene, because I can't use tengo to talk about my kid. Mi hijo tiene 27 años. Mi hijo tiene 25 años. Bien? Uh, so it's got to be that. And be very, very careful with this word. Años. I want everybody to say años with me now. Años. 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 Never, 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 never pronounce that word. Anos. Because anos means that. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a part of the body. Yes, which matters if you're at a proctologist or a gastroenterologist, if you're, you know, with your gastric guy, but nah, not good to talk about how old you are. Años, nya, nya, nya. años, tener años, okay? Uh, another common tener idiom is tener frío. In Spanish, you don't say, I am cold. And I think she talked about this a little bit um, in the video. You could technically say, soy frío, but then you're saying, I'm a cold person. I'm a cold, hard person. And that's not really what you mean. You mean you're cold because you don't have a sweater. You're cold because the temperature is low. Ten tengo frío, I'm cold. Tengo calor, I'm hot. Here's some other expressions that they use with tener. Uh, tener dolor de, to have a pain in some part of your body. An ache, they use the word pain, dolor, instead of the word ache. Tengo dolor de cabeza, I have a headache. Tengo dolor de estómago, I've got a stomach ache. Okay, that's a common thing. This is another thing. Tener is often used with the word que. Que has many translations, one of them meaning that. But here the que doesn't really mean anything. You just must use tener with que to say you have to do something. If you want to talk about an obligation, it's tener que. Like, tengo que practicar, I have to practice. Tenemos que hablar español, we have to speak Spanish. So. Tener is used to express have to, like we say, I have to, meaning I must do it. It is an obligation, okay? And tener razón, to be right. And there are more, there are more. We won't go into all of them. There are more, more, more. I will give you the whole, the whole file with this. But just know that tener is used for dual purpose. Most of the time, uh, most of the time you're using tener to talk about what you physically possess, but sometimes it is used with certain expressions where in English, we will say that I am hungry or we are thirsty or they are 10 years old, they're just kids or she is cold, she is hot, okay? And in Spanish, we won't use ser, we won't even use estar we will use tener for these special ideas. And again, this is something we're gonna come back to fall and do a review because everybody always needs a review, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go further than that right now because we're gonna move on. I'm menos que, unless, do you have any questions about that? It's it's a like memorizing what those chunks are, getting used to those chunks, and I'll I'll send that out so you can kind of ponder that. Marilyn, I have a quick uh, personal pronoun question. Yeah. To and Sue. So if I'm talking about my husband, it would be to, but if I was talking about my grandmother, it would be ah okay. These are um, 
technically they don't call these personal pronouns, although they are kind of personal. These are what they call possessive pronouns. I bet Meaning, I have to you say. own something, right? And so here's what it means. Okay, so Mary is asking about how to say my or your or his or her or their. Ooh, yeah, I can't even spell their <laughs> or our, right? Uh, okay, all those words are called possessive adjectives. They are adjectives. So they're going to fall into this category of like, you know, adjectives that were like words like tall, short, easy, hard, fast, slow. Uh, um, you know, adjectives, they describe things. They tell you what something's like. But these are special kinds of adjectives because they tell who something belongs to. My, your, his, her, their, our. So uh, here's what you need to know. Except for the word our, these, uh, these possessive adjectives only get two forms. They're either onesies or more than one. And the noun you're talking about always determines which word you use. This is going to hold true in adjectives. So this is going to tie in with what we're doing in a minute. Mi amigo, my friend. Okay. But if I have more than one friend, mis amigos, it has to be mis. So my is either me, I have this many of that thing, or mis, I have a bunch of those things, right? Okay. If you're talking to your husband, Mary, and you want to say, oh, take your car today. Yeah. Don't take my car. Take your car. Obviously to her husband. Uh, uh, tu carro. Your car. So tu Tu, notice tu with no accent mark, which it sounds the same way as tu with an accent mark, but when you write it, the word your doesn't get an accent mark. The word you, the human being, does get an accent mark. Tu carro, your car. The way you say your cars, let's say your husband collects cars and he's got like three antique cars and he loves those cars. Then it's your cars. And the word cars, carros is plural. So the word your also has to become plural. Tus carros. Tu carro, this many. Tus carros. You've got, I don't know, two, three, depende, right? Now, oddly enough, to say his or to say her or to say their. It's either su or sus. So this is kind of a vague word. Su, if the thing that is owned is this many. Sus, uh, a plural word, if the thing that is owned is two, three, four, five, 15, however many. So let's say you're talking about his house or her house, or their house. It's only one house, so it's su casa. Even if it's their house, it can't be sus casa, because casa is this many things. So the word talking about casa is this many, su, singular, okay? But let's say your, uh, your friend has a house here and a house in Heber Overgaard up in the cooler country. And so you wanna talk about their houses, sus casas. Sus casas can mean his houses, her houses, she has more than one, their houses. It can even mean, it can even mean formal your. So su and sus is used for many, many ideas. But notice all of these words, me, mis, tu, tus, su, sus, they don't tell us gender like a lot of adjectives will. 
okay? So if you want to set, you're talking about your husband's car, Mary, su carro, his car. But if you're talking to your husband, you want to say, hey, take your car, it's tu carro. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The only word out of that whole group that is kind of shifty and odd is this one, our. Our cannot go into just singular and plural, like me, mis, tu, tus, su, sus. Our needs to go into both gender and number. So there are going to be four words for our. Nuestro for a masculine, one thing. Nuestros for masculine, plural things. Nuestra for feminine thing owned, one of them. And nuestras for feminine, more than one. The gender of these words to say our, nuestro, nuestros, nuestra, nuestras, does not depend on if the our group is a bunch of ladies or a bunch of men. It depends on the thing that is owned. Okay. Okay. So our house, casa is a house. It's only this many things. So to say our house, it'll have to be a feminine thing. Nuestra casa. Okay. To say our children. Hijos. Hijos is a masculine plural word. So nuestros hijos. Bien. Uh, right? To say our cell phones. Celulares. It's a, excuse me, it's a masculine word. So we'll put a masculine our word in front of it. Nuestros celulares. Okay, bien. Uh, to say our office, or ooh, let's say offices, oficinas. Let's say you've got more than one office because you have offices in different cities, right? You have a company. Uh, it'll be nuestras because oficinas is feminine and plural, nuestras oficinas. Okay, Bien? Thank you. Yeah, we're not gonna talk too much about the possessives, but it is something you might have seen in the chapter, so that's just a quickie. Okay, we're gonna talk about adjectives in general. En general, in very general terms. Okay. Adjectives are descriptive words. That means they tell us something abstract or physical about uh, people, places, things. Uh, oddly enough, adjectives in Spanish have to agree with, that means be in the same form as the thing they are talking about. Okay, so I had asked you to check out this video. This is a video that, uh, correct me if I am wrong. This was the video, I did send you this video, right? To watch over the week, or did I not? I, I believe I did. I still, this, does this look familiar? Yes, that was just one sheet though, right? Um. Well, it was, this was a video. Did you, did I, I sent you this video or did I not send you this? Video? I don't remember having seen it, Marilyn. Okay, let, let, let's, let's just see the examples. This is gonna talk about, this is gonna talk about what happens really with all adjectives, but we look at it from just the perspective of color, color, okay? Color is an example. Color is only one of many types of adjectives you might, talk about. So um, I want you to notice that the thing you're talking about, when you describe it, any descriptive words, meaning adjectives, will have to go into a form that agrees with, with the masculine or feminine, the singular or plural thing you're talking about. 
Okay, so we'll check this out. Azul. First, we're just going to get the words. Azul, blue, right? So you can see what these Verde. are. Verde. Marrón. Marrón, brown. Anaranjado. Anaranjado, orange. Some people, just so you know, do shorten this to naranja. Some people do. It's a regional variation. Amarillo. Amarillo, yellow. Rojo. Rojo, red. So let's stop here, okay? And first of all, I want to tell you, I told you about that anaranjado is the hard one to pronounce, right? Anaranjado, orange. Sometimes they shorten that to naranja, especially Mexican folks, a lot of them like to shorten that word. The word marron for brown. Brown is a problem. Some countries don't like to use marron. I've heard marron, uh, you heard marron in Spain all the time. You hear marron in uh, uh, Colombia all the time. You hear café instead of marron from lots of people uh, um, from Mexico. So a lot of Mexicans don't like to use the word marron to say brown. To say brown, they'll say café. Café means coffee. But it's just a regional thing, okay? Café. But I want you to notice something because words are going to change form. And the words um, will do one thing if they end in a consonant or the letter E, consonant like ma marron or azul or verde. But they'll do something different if they end in an O, like amarajado, like amarillo, like rojo. Let's look at some more colors. Rosado. Rosado, pink. Morado. Morado, purple. Negro. Negro, black. Gris. Gris, gray. Blanco. Blanco, white. Okay, so let's take a look at these. Anytime an adjective, whether it's a color or any other description, but we're starting just with colors. If the adjective ends in an O for let's say the base form of the word. If it ends in O, anaranjado, amarillo, rojo, rosado, morado, negro, blanco, they have to have a corresponding feminine form. And so we'll flip the O to an A. They'll become anaranjada, ending in an A. Amarilla, ending in an A. Roja, ending in an A. Rosada, ending in an A. Morada, ending in an A. Negra, ending in an A. Blanca, ending in an A. Okay? So if it ends in an O, it'll need to have a, a corresponding A form, a feminine form. If the adjective, the descriptive word, does not end in O, like azul, like verde, like marron, like gris, then we use the same word for masculine and the same word for feminine. Okay? I don't change the form of those non-O words. I might make them plural, but I don't have to make them feminine because the masculine and the feminine will share the same form for azul, for verde, for marron, for gris. I only have to change these kinds of adjectives when I make them plural, okay? In which case I'll add ES, just S, E-S, E-S, and we'll let it roll. Trucos. Trucos means tricks. Truco número uno. Atención al plural. So pay attention to if you need to make it plural. So you want to say red cars, okay? Literally in Spanish, they wind up saying cars, reds. Make the word red plural if the word cars is plural. That's what they do. Azules. Azules. That's how we make it plural. Verdes. Verdes. Just an S. 
Marrones. Marrones, hernillas. Anaranjados. Just had an ass. Amarillos. Just had an ass. Rojos. Just had an ass. Rosados. Just had an ass. Morados. Just had an ass. Negros. Just had an ass. Grises. Ah, add an ES because it doesn't end in O. Blancos. Just add an S. Truco número dos. Atención al femenino. Los colores con la O tienen género femenino. Ok. The colors that end in an O letter have to go into a feminine form, gender. Okay. The colors that do not end in O don't go into a gender change. So she's taking out all the ones that oh, oh, that do not end in O. So notice that. Anaranjado. Anaranjada. Amarillo. Amarilla. Rojo. Roja. Rosado, rosada, morado, morada, negro, negra, blanco, blanca. Truco número tres. También existe el plural femenino. So the feminine forms that get a special feminine form with an A at the end do get an S to make them plural. Anaranjadas, amarillas, rojas, rosadas, moradas, negras, blancas. Vamos a practicar. ¿Qué colores? Atención al femenino y al plural. Rojo. Roja. They're just showing you if it's feminine, it becomes roja. Ah, feminine plural. Rojas. Rojas. Azul. 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 To talk about feminine blue, it's still azul. It does not change because the last letter of azul is not O. So azul is both feminine and masculine. Don't have to do anything to that word. Azules. But plural form gets an ES. Last letter is an L. That's not O, so we just add ES. Azules. Masculine plural, same form. Amarillos. Amarillos, masculine and plural. Amarilla. Amarilla, feminine, just one. Verde. Verde, green, does not end in O. So, verde is both the masculine and the feminine form. I only have to worry about making it plural if I have a plural thing. Verdes. Verdes, plural. Just an S at the end. Anaranjado. Anaranjada. Grises. I need to make that one plural. Grises. Gris. Gris, just one. Gray. 
Grises. Just plural because gris ends in an S. Negros. Negros, plural and masculine. Negra. Blanca. Blancas. Morada. Morados. Marrones. Brown. And in, in the Mexican dialect of Spanish, people will not use the word marrones. They would use cafés. C-A-F-E-S. Cafés. That's just the word they tend to favor in Mexico. Marrón. Marrón does not end in also. It's also the same exact word for feminine. I don't have to change it. Rosada. Pink. Talk about a feminine thing. Rosadas. Pink, talking about plural feminine things. Okay, bien. Let's take a look at some examples. And these, uh, these examples hold true, not just for colors, but any descriptive word. That means adjectives. Adjectives have to be in the same form as the thing noun or the person noun that they're talking about okay and we don't do that at all in english so i will send you this form this gives you the same thing and you see azul azules verde verdes marron marrones the last letter is not an o so they're the same for masculine, feminine. I only have to worry about making them plural. Add an S or add an ES, and I will send you a file that tells you how to do that. So you don't need to write these down. But here are some words that end in O. Anaranjado, amarillo, rojo, rosado, morado, negro. They have feminine forms. So if the thing you're talking about is Feminine, it would be negra, morada, rosada, rosa, amarilla, anaranjada. And then we'll get corresponding masculine or feminine forms but with an S at the end to make them plural, right? Uh, blanco, blanca, blancos, and blancas. And gris is the last one they have there. Gris, gray. Gris does not end in an O, and therefore it's the same for masculine or feminine thing, grises, okay? We're going to take this a bit further. We're going to look at this together. La bandera. Bandera is a flag. La bandera. What can I know about this word bandera, this noun, this thing that is a flag? Is that a masculine or a feminine word? Feminine. A feminine word. So if I talk about the colors in the French flag, I have to use a feminine word to talk about those colors. Okay, and they give us one of the colors. There are three colors. Hay tres. There are three colors. <laughs> tres colores. Hay tres colores. La bandera de Francia. France's flag. La bandera de Francia es azul. Oops. And I'm going to move this down so you can see the colors. Azul. Blanca y roja. Blanca y roja. Azul, blanca y roja. All feminine words because all those colors, azul, blanca, roja, are talking about bandera, a feminine thing. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the flag of Germany. And I'm going to tell you the flag of Germany has black, red, and yellow. Black, red, and yellow. 
la bandera de Alemania. Alemania es Germany. La bandera, flag. La bandera de Alemania es negra. We need the yellow and red words. Roja. Roja. And amarilla. Y amarilla. Bien. The thing you're talking about determines if the descriptive word goes into a feminine form or a plural form or a masculine form. Okay. La bandera de Estados Unidos tiene estrellas. Estrellas are stars. I want you to look at that word stars. Estrellas. It ends in an A-S. What kind of word is star? Is it masculine or feminine? feminine. Um. It's feminine. Estrellas. So we're talking just about the stars and the color of the stars. La bandera de Estados Unidos, the US flag, tiene estrellas. What color? Blanco. Okay. Blancas. Blancas. Tiene estrellas blancas. Bien. Okay. Los tomates son. Tomatoes are. And let's talk about when they're ripe. Rojos. Rojos. Rojos needs to be both masculine because it's los tomates and plural. Los tomates son rojos. Los tomates son rojos. Okay. Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson always has a particular skin color. Homer Simpson is. Amarillo. Amarillo. Es amarillo. Muy bien. Homer Simpson es amarillo. El pelo. I'm not talking about Marge. I'm talking about her hair that goes up like that. El pelo. And we're talking about pelo. El pelo de Marge Simpson es? Azul. 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 She has blue hair. I know. Los pitufos, that's the word for Smurfs. Smurfs are very popular in Europe. They're not popular here. Uh, and I'll give you that one. Some people here don't know the Smurfs at all. Los Smurfs son azules. They are little blue characters. They are little blue men. So because they're little blue men, they're azules. Azules, okay? Ah, oh, but there are two colors for chocolate because there are two kinds of chocolate. El chocolate. El chocolate es... Blanco. Blanco. O oh, means or. Marrón. Marrón. El chocolate es blanco o marrón. Pepinos are cucumbers. Los pepinos, more than one. You're talking about all of this kind of veggie. Los pepinos son? Verdes. Verdes. Son verdes. Carbón is like charcoal for grill. El carbón es? Negro. Negro. Bien. La leche. Milk. La leche? Blanco. Blanca. Ah, blanca. ¿Por qué blanca? Why blanca? It's feminine. It's a feminine thing. La leche is a feminine noun. So it has to be blanca. La sangre. Sangre means blood. Blood. Roja. La sangre es... Roja. Roja. It's got to be roja. A feminine word because sangre, blood, is a feminine thing. Bien? Okay? Bien? Okay. Um... Adjectives go into specific forms. So I will send you this file so you can look at that again and ponder that. Uh, we are also going to start to take a look at some adjectives that change forms. Uh, and 
the, uh, well, not change forms, I'm sorry. Uh, some adjectives that are not about colors. Some adjectives that talk about other descriptions that are not colors. So uh, this will be like everything in chapter five, capitulo cinco, chapter five of your book. So it'll be really from, ooh, they started on page 70, 70. They're gonna start to give you a lot of vocabulary. So this week, look through not just the color vocabulary from chapter five, but all the other vocabulary. And on page 70, en la página 70, 70, on page 70, they're gonna talk about a lot of adjectives that are common in conversation, like expensive versus inexpensive. Uh, uh, big versus small, narrow versus wide, uh, um, uh, just lots and lots of adjectives here, short versus long, like short sleeves versus long sleeves, okay, uh, pretty versus ugly, new versus old, so they're going to give us a lot of opposite adjectives, and I will send you this set of slides so that it starts to sink in. But you will see from the slides uh, that when we talk about a car, un carro, we use masculine words, okay? If we're talking about masculine words here, we've got these. Uh, oh, if we talk about a plural word, you're gonna see how descriptions like old, viejos, um, if we talk about son zapatos viejos, they are old shoes, we need to make the adjective plural to go along with the thing we're talking about, okay? Uh, this is something we do not do in English. Literally in Spanish, you say, they are shoes, olds. You make the word old plural, okay? Okay. So you'll see various examples of these different things. So pay attention to if I have a feminine word with a feminine description, right? Or if I've got a masculine plural thing with a masculine plural description. So I will send all of these along. Um, I had hoped we were going to get to our La Casa stuff and we are running out of time. So here's what I am going to give you. Um, I am going to give you, send you out this page and we're going to see if you can change the word in parentheses into the form it needs to be based on the thing it's talking about. And remember, Adjectives, descriptive words that do not end in all, use the same masculine and feminine word, no change. But adjectives that do end in all will get both a masculine and a different feminine form. They may go from singular to plural. So see if you can get some of these. There are gonna be one or two of those I'm gonna tell you to skip because there are some hard ones in there, but uh, not too many. You'll probably only skip a couple of them. We'll see if you can actually use adjectives in the form they need to be in. The adjective looks at the thing it talks about. So importante looks at escuela. Simpatico has to be in the same form as las chicas. Uh, azul in number four has to be in the form of Plumas, it has to agree with plumas, a feminine plural thing. Does that make sense? See? Yeah. Si? Bien. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to see, and that's just a fill in the blank thing. Um, uh, I also want you next week to come into class and be able to share two ideas. Okay. So here's idea number one I want you to bring some item to show on screen or a photograph of that item if you don't if you really love your truck and you want to talk about your truck that's fine but 
show me a picture, obviously. Um, yeah. And I want you to describe, I want you to say, tengo un, tengo un, ah, tengo una taza. I have a cup. Es mi taza favorita. It's my favorite cup. La taza es azul y verde y anaranjada y roja. I'm talking about the colors. La taza es grande. It's big. Bien. Bring one thing. Tell me something about it. Describe something about it. Say it's big, small, colors, whatever. You may need word reference, and I'll give you the link to that, to look up a word. Like let's say you want to say heavy. Maybe you have to look up the word heavy, pesado, right? Okay. Um, or maybe you want the word useful, util, and you need to look up the word useful whatever description you need. Okay, so that's thing number one, bring one item. The next thing I want you to do is, um, I want you to talk a little bit about la casa, and I apologize we didn't get to this today. I want you to describe um, how many rooms you have in your house. And again, in the email, I'll put the whole description. So I want to say, you know, ah, tengo una casa grande. So, por ejemplo, for example, I would start off with, tengo una casa grande. I have a big house. So we're going to use tengo or forms of tener. And now I'm going to talk about what the house has. La casa tiene. La casa tiene. The house has. And I'm going to mention the rooms. La casa tiene una sala. La casa tiene un comedor. Rooms in the house. La casa tiene una cocina. Hmm. La casa tiene cuatro habitaciones. Four bedrooms. La casa tiene... Tres baños. The house has three bathrooms. Bien. So I want you to talk about how many rooms are in your house. That's it. And maybe look again at these things and we'll use these. And, and so we're gonna be combining la casa vocabulary and adjective vocabulary, okay? Uh, so talk about your house, talk about one item that you have. Does that make sense? And I'll put in the email my example so you know what to do with that. Bien? Okay. And I will not say go beyond and do more. Make sure you know the vocabulary of la casa. Make sure you know the vocabulary of those adjective words that you had in, in this chapter. And we'll come back next week and actually use it to talk about something you own and what kind of rooms you've got in your house. Está bien. Está bien. Okay, vale, magnifico. Uh, I'll send you my examples with the email. And that will, be, eso es todo. That's it for today. I thought we were gonna get a little bit further, but it's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> Day to day. Okay? Todo bien? All good? Yeah. Magnifico. Okay. Nos vemos. Um, you will do some more talking next week to talk about your stuff and your house. And y nos vemos el martes. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Adios. Thank okay. you. Adios.